In 1933, Fred Bear created a legacy, pursuing his lifelong passion. Fred's mission was to ensure archery remains accessible to everyone. Here at Bear Archery, we promise to never forget the principles our brands were founded on. From the youngest archer to the oldest, we strive to build bows that give you the best shooting experience. Visit beararchery.com to discover more. Hunting boots are a critical component of any successful hunt. Whether walking a short distance to your blind or trudging miles through rugged terrain, your feet are carrying the load. Without the right boots, you could give up early and lose out on that trophy just over the ridge. At Midway USA, we make selecting boots for your next hunt easier. With just a few clicks of a mouse, you can decide on what's important, like waterproofing, insulation, size, width, and savings. For just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors, check out MidwayUSA.com. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. Episode 141. Today we're going to talk about fighting fish, specifically some things that I don't think get talked about enough when we talk about fighting fish. There's a lot of basic information out there that is incredibly important for new anglers to really get a grasp on. Everything from how to set the hook to how to maintain pressure on the fish, to positioning yourself when you are fighting the fish. And those things are, are incredibly necessary. But I think some of that stuff is, well, first of all, it's really difficult to communicate in a podcast, especially setting a hook. Uh, it's, it's a trial and error thing. And, and honestly, if that's something that you are struggling with, or you go through a period of time where you struggle with it, and uh, like you, you've lost the feeling, you get the, the yips and the way you're setting a hook, then head to the bluegill pond, throw on a dry fly, throw on a nymph, watch the fish take your fly, and set the hook and try to get that good read on it. Do it where the fish are close to you, far away from you, coming towards you, going away from you. And uh, I think it's a great way to kind of get your groove back, kind of get a feel for setting the hook again. Same thing can be done with streamers, same thing can be done with poppers. Not that bluegill are dumb or easy or anything like that. They just, well, they are easier than trout. They are easier than some bigger fish. And those skills are going to translate one-to-one. I think oftentimes what happens with hook setting is that you, you miss a fish and then you get anxious. And then that anxiety leads to missing another fish. And that compounds and all of a sudden you're just setting the hook wildly and crazy. And I've had times where I've done that where I've, I've missed hook sets and I've really just had like a really um, a tough day because of it uh, for a couple hours. And I will loosen my grip significantly on the rod, especially if I'm like high stick nymphing or fishing a dry fly. I'll really like only kind of cradle the rod almost like you're holding a cigar, like not squeezing it tightly, but just kind of gently holding it with a few fingers. And that time that it takes for me to grip my rod tight to then set the hook is enough for me to not pull that thing right out of the fish's mouth. So again, like I said, setting the hook is an incredibly basic thing. And I said I wasn't going to talk about it. And here I am talking about it for two minutes. But uh, that is something that is worth practicing because unless you set the hook right, you're not going to fight the fish at all, let alone fight the fish right. So I'm going to talk about a few different things that I think are not the common, like, Google how to fight a fish. It's going to be the first three or four things that pop up. You read the back of field and stream, you know, a little cute little infographic on how to fight a fish. These might not be the things that pop up, but they're things that I think are worth communicating. And the things that I talk with people about when I go fishing, whether it be my kids or other people, like things to kind of keep in mind when you get in the situation. And the very first thing is really more for if you are in a awkward situation position on the water. Now this could be because there's a lot of brush behind you. It could be because you can't get into the water, like it's really steep or it's a spring creek or the regulations prohibit it, or it's really, really fast water, or maybe there is some big uh, obstruction around you, or there's just something going on in the water. There's a really fast run. We've all been in those situations where like the water is moving incredibly fast and if the fish gets in that water then it's going to be trouble and there's no no um fish probably in that incredibly fast shoot but there's a little pocket off and you want to cast into that spot because you just know there's a fish there 
Um, if you get into a situation where it's not just an open stretch of water where you can fight the fish and pull it in, what I think is really important is to make a plan of attack. How are you going to approach this? You're, you might have a perfect angle for casting. You might be able to have your feet firmly below you at, to, to get in a position to present a fly to the fish. But are you in a position where you can actually land this fish if you hook it? Or are you going to go through the trouble of getting your fly into position, the fish actually taking the fly, and then you're going to be completely out of luck because there's some big log jam that's going to run down into and there's nothing you can do about it or you're going to land it and you're stuck with pulling the fish and the line up out of the water to try to grab with your net you know when you get in a situation try to map out some options of how you're going to catch that fish how you're actually going to land the thing otherwise you are potentially going to fall in or lose the fish or something ridiculous like that but just have a game plan now you have no control of what that fish is going to do well i take that back you have some control and we'll talk about that a little bit later with one of the other things i wanted to, to mention in the podcast today but you can't control where that fish goes so if you want to catch a fish that's next to a big brush pile that's submerged partially and if it does so, your 6x tippet's going to get hung up in it and you're going to be out of luck. Well, that's just the risk that you have to take. But you can certainly help it out by not casting over top of that brush pile. Like, that might be the great way to stay obscured from that fish is to come and approach it next to that cover. But if that fish runs towards you, what are you going to do? There's, there's very little that you can do. And it's one of those kind of compromises they have to make. And as you get a feel for your rod and how it treats the line and how much tension you can put on a fish, then you know you can really torque, you know, like 3 and 4x. I mean, you can put a lot of pressure on those tippets and really move a fish and move it away from an obstruction like that. But even before you get into that situation, figure out, is there a way I can make my presentation from a different spot? Is there a way I can get to a place where maybe I'm standing in the water as opposed to being up on the bank? Um, you know, it, it's all about finding that sweet spot where you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're going to spook the fish or you're not able to make the cast, but then if you're in a situation where you can't land or fight the fish, if maybe there's no vertical space above you where you cannot extend your rod up to, to make the hook set, let alone fight that fish, is that a worthwhile place to be in. So just kind of take a, um, um, a gauge of your surroundings. This is important for reading the water. And, it, you know, you have to remember, you are not some uh, separate entity when you're fishing the water. You are part of the environment. You are, are part of it. And so part of the challenge is, of course, how do you insert yourself into that environment so that you can not only present the fly of the fish, but you can fight the fish. So again, that means... Put yourself in a position where you are going to be obscured, where you're going to be able to make that presentation, but where you can also fight and land that fish. So it's just a, a good thing to think about, and it might be between, you know, maybe choice 1A and 1B of where you stand to cast is going to be determined by where you can fight and land that fish. So that's the first thing. Second thing, um, what do you do with your rod? What do you do with your rod? I've seen it a billion times where, and I've done it a, a billion times, where you set that hook and you want to give it a little bit more oomph. And so you raise that rod tip up super high. Well, now you have that challenge of, of what? Your line, if you're right-handed, your line is in your left hand and your, your rod is straight up vertical. And if that fish doesn't have a lot of pull going on, if it's not a particularly large fish, the water's not really fast or it's not really a fighter, then all of a sudden you don't have a whole lot of tension. And what do you do? You have to be able to compensate for the slack you're about to introduce into the system by doing one of two things. If you drop your rod hand where you have the tension going from that fish to your line to your rod tip down to your right hand, if you drop that down, now all of a sudden there it, the line is going to go up through the guides and now there's more line in between the rod tip and the fish. 
So what do you have to do? You have that line in your left hand. Well, there's a couple of things. I would say the first thing and the easiest thing, and this is something that's definitely worth practicing, is you have that line in your left hand. And I know this is this is great podcasting. Hopefully you're not trying to pantomime this as you're driving, uh, if that if that's where you are where you are. But one of the things that I've found to be an incredibly helpful full tip is you have your line in your left hand, your rods in your right hand. It might be extended way over your head. You've probably gotten yourself in a position that you shouldn't be in. You take your line hand with that line in it and you pull it over your right shoulder. So I'm doing this in my bedroom right now just to, <laughs> to show you uh, with, with my words. Um, you pull that line hand, your left hand, um, over your right shoulder and now you're able to grab that line with one of your fingers, probably your, your, your index finger, on your rod hand and pinch it against the grip of your rod bring that rod down now no line is going to be sliding up through the guides and out the tip you're able to maintain that tension and as soon as you pull it down and get into that position where you need that rod to be which is just you know right in front of you a comfortable 90 degree angle of your your elbow uh, from your shoulder to your uh, to your wrist and your hand and now you can re-engage that line hand with your with the line and start stripping or figuring out how to play it on the reel. But that's a really quick and easy way to get out of that jam. I've done it before, and it's almost like you forget to do you forget what you're supposed to do with your left hand um, when you you've got a fish on in a precarious situation with your right hand. So once again, um, you you maintain that that uh, tension on the fish with your rod, with your line hand, your left hand. You go over your right shoulder if you're right-handed, and then you're able to pinch that line against the rod grip bring it down to where you can actually fight and now you can get the fish on the line versus on or on the reel depending on on what you're doing and what your choice is and actually let's talk about that really quickly i don't think there's a right way and a wrong way i strip in stripers all the time and i don't think there's a problem as long as i have my stripping basket i strip in stripers if i know it's a particularly large fish then i will definitely try to get it on the reel as soon as possible but for a lot of the schoolies um, and fish that are kind of a medium size, I have no problem stripping the thing. And if it goes for a run, if I have a stripping basket, more often than not, it's not going to get tangled. And I don't think I've ever had a, a fish run so frequently um, and pull out enough line that I'm not able to, to manage it. Is it the best practices? Maybe not. But you take that and then you, you kind of dial it back down for trout. I think you can strip in almost anything. Now, if you're in an incredibly fast river and you have an incredibly large fish, then you're going to want to get that thing on the reel. But I think people stressing out about getting their fish on the reel is what leads to people losing fish because that's a really integral time for, for most fish fights, uh, those first few minutes. And if you spend those first few seconds and those first maybe 15, 20, 30 seconds trying to figure out how to get your your fish on the reel. So again, I'm not defining my terms. Instead of just stripping that line in, you know, actually using the reel and using its drag or, or palming it or just applying pressure to that reel. Um, if, if you try to find a way to get all that excess line that may be at your feet because you've cast and you've mended or you've stripped or you haven't made as long of a cast as you had in previous casts and you have some excess line at your feet, now what do you do is you, you like I was talking about earlier, you pinch that uh, line against your cork and then you reel in all that slack line. But while you're doing that, what's happening out in front of you is this fish is fighting and running, and you can lose a fish that way because you are paying more attention to navigating all the line that's around your feet or on the, the water in front of you and trying to get it untangled around the rod butt and things like that. And for most fish, you're able to play them on the reel. So I'm not going to steer you away from engaging your really nice disc drag if you want to. But especially if this is something that you are, you're, you're learning, you're learning how to fight fish, you're learning how to pay attention to what fish are doing, and you've lost a couple of fish, then I would say that would be one thing that I would cut out. If it's not easy to get the fish on the reel to maintain that tension from your reel to your um, rod tip on the line, then just strip the fish in. And as you're doing that, or as you're just maintaining pressure and tension on that fish as it's fighting in those first few seconds of fighting that fish, you can see what that fish is doing and you can adjust accordingly as long as you have that line in your line hand. 
Um, and so I guess that would be the next bit of advice. I, I've lost track. No notes, when you might say. Well, obviously no notes. I have, a, I have a rough outline, okay? So the next thing I would say is pay attention to that fish's body language. What is it doing? And that's going to do a couple things for you. Uh, first and foremost, it's going to tell you what to do with your rod. You want to steer that fish. You want to move its head in the direction that you want it to go. A fish cannot swim in a direction other than where its head is pointing. I mean, you've never watched a fish look over its shoulder, have you? Think about that for a second. No. Fish swim in the direction where their head is going. Of course, they can buck against that and be pulling their head back into the direction they want to go, to that cover, to that faster water, to that deeper pool. But you pay attention to where they are going and you move them away from it. So if they're wanting to go straight, then you pull them to the right or to the left and you can pull them into the current. So if the river is flowing from your right to your left and they're running straight ahead of you, you pull them into the current and now they're having to swim harder and exert more energy to either A, go in the direction they want to go or even just take your cues and move upstream. And the whole point isn't to tire a fish out to exhaustion. It's The whole point is to get the fish worn out enough that it's able to come in to you and you can make that quick uh, release and they're, they're off and good. So by keeping the attention on that fish immediately after setting the hook, paying attention to where it's running and then moving, literally moving that thing's head by applying significant pressure on that fish by moving your rod to the right or to the left based upon where it is then you're able to tire the fish out quicker and that's a, a, a almost like reading the water you begin to develop these subtle nuances and what you see a fish doing and I think it's important pay attention to where that fish is you know your rod and your reel and your line unless it's some traumatic tangle, they're all relatively known commodities. If you are comfortable with your rod in your rod hand and your line in your line hand, you're going to be able to figure out where all that stuff is without looking at it. Um, and especially as you fish more and more, you know, there's really no reason to look at your rod and your reel and your line while you are making the presentation. Uh, I mean, you can look at your line that's out in front of you, but the line that's, you know, bunched up at your feet and stuff like that, you know, you should be fishing enough that you know where the, all that is. It's kind of like typing. Like when you are typing, you're not looking down at your keyboard. You're looking at what's on the screen. The same thing is true when, when you are fighting a fish. You should be watching that fish. And only when there's a problem should you look at your gear. And as you watch that fish, you can see where that fish is going, and you're able to apply um, the, the tension that you need to on that fish to, to move it. And sometimes that means moving that rod across your body. Sometimes that might even mean you shifting where you are standing so that you can compensate for where that fish goes. Because that's an incredibly difficult thing. Like if a fish runs, tw runs toward you, um, runs towards you, I, don't know, I can't even think about how to say that phrase but if that happens if a fish approaches you how about that then you might need to pivot so that you're able to move your rod in a, in a much um, more significant manner you think about that you know uh, your rod tip is going to move exponentially more than the butt of your rod is so if you move the butt of your rod if you just rotate your wrist from you know maybe 90 degrees um, your wrist is moving three to four inches the rod butt is moving four to five inches but the tip of that rod is probably moving something like nine or ten feet. So you can really change where that the pressure is being applied to a fish by not just moving your arm, but moving your hips. And, and in doing so, you can really uh, make that fish change its course and trajectory if it's running towards an obstruction, towards deeper water, faster water, or running towards you. All you got to do is turn uh, you know, your hips so that you are now parallel or perpendicular, whatever is opposite for you, or to that fish, and you can now move your arm in, in a way that's able to get that fish moving um, uh, in a more advantageous direction for you, or get more tension on that fish so that you are not losing uh, ground and potentially having your little barbless hook pop out of there. So that's a lot, and it's kind of like 
basic stuff, but at the same time, it's the kind of things that maybe you've lost a couple of fish, maybe you've struggled in getting fish in, maybe you've been doing this for a long time, but something that I said resonated or, or stuck with you. And again, as I've said before, maybe it's that you know these things, but I've given you a couple of words that can help you articulate them to somebody that you are teaching. So that's my wish with, with this How to Fight Fish podcast. I'm, I anticipate, I'm looking at kind of some other things I want to talk about, that I'll do another How to Fight a Fish podcast sometime in the, the coming months, or if not, sometime in the next year. There's many, many great resources out there. I don't have any off the top of my head, but I know that if you put it in YouTube, if you put it on, on Google and say how to fight a trout, how to fight a smallmouth bass, how to fight a striper, how to fight whatever, there is going to be an article out there that gives you the most basic brass tacks how to fight a fish information, and then there's going to give you some of the particulars with dealing with any one of these fish and their surroundings. But the things that I mentioned today, kind of, um, you know, get yourself on a roadmap of what you're going to do based upon a couple of situations that fish could put you in. Uh, don't worry about getting that fish on the reel unless it's an incredibly large fish. Uh, and make sure you maintain tension by putting your rod in the right place. And then that fun little tip I gave about how to get the fish on uh, on tension uh, if you are fully extended. Just a couple things to think about and hopefully a couple things that will be helpful for you as you are out fighting lots and lots of fish. Well, this week on the podcast, two articles, and the first one was called All Rising Fish. All Rising Fish. Virtually every fish rises. I mean, I've seen some suckers like rise up and turn around and, and take bugs off of the surface from an inverted position. And you know what? I tried to fish for them because there's just something incredibly fun about getting fish to rise to dry flies. And my encouragement in this article was that you give it a whirl. Trout are not going to play ball. There's a lot of times where trout are just going to want to eat the bugs that are tumbling around the bottom. And there's times where I simply don't want to nymph. I want to get out and throw something and watch a fish splash on the surface and then fight it that way. So you know what? Maybe the trout can have their nymphs. They can have their little buggy critters that are bouncing around the bottom. I'm going to go find some fish that want to do what I want them to do. And they're happy to do it, and I'm happy to do it. So that's kind of a humorous approach at uh, a, a legitimate topic. Um, and I've written about that in the past, about how you can really hone in your dry fly fishing by fishing for warm water species. It's a lot of fun. And sometimes it's just it's what you want. I know for me, there's a lot of times where, where that's what I want. So all rising fish. Wednesday's article... It's called Dams and Fly Fishing Media. Dams and Fly Fishing Media. Something weird has happened, and I really don't want to sound like I'm complaining. It's just it's it, it's intriguing to me, and I don't know how to tap into the data uh, enough to figure out what's going on. But this has happened to me at least one time before in a significant way. It's where across multiple social media platforms, the referral traffic for castingacross.com, the website, has dipped just like overnight. And and it's lasted, you know, a couple of weeks to a month before. And where I'm at like week three now of where this has happened, where for no explainable reason, the referral traffic from social media sources has really just kind of died off. There's still a lot of traffic. A lot of people are reading this stuff, which which I love, but it's just confusing to me and a little frustrating um, because I have no clue how or why it's happened. Um, and you know, I, the audience is growing specifically because of the podcast. It's a whole other group of people that are exposed to casting across. And so that's good. And that's, that's fine. But it's just, has kind of, uh, reminded me that there's a lot of good stuff out there. I, I'm obviously, I'm a little partial to the content on casting across.com, but I wonder how many other kind of, uh, mid-sized fly fishing websites and resources don't get the exposure that they can and and should get because something in a social media algorithm is just not liking what they're laying down. Um, I, and this is not to be paranoid and I don't think like 
Mark Zuckerberg or you know anyone's out to get me. Uh, I certainly don't think that. But I've gotten a lot of requests for advertising from social media lately, and I feel like maybe I hit some sort of plateau. And uh, they said, okay, this is the kind of account that we want to advertise because they probably feel like they've hit a plateau. And I wonder if the algorithm is punishing me for not doing that. I don't know. Stranger things happen on social media, and you have to. No matter how much of a conspiracy theorist or right wing or left wing or wherever you are, you have to admit stranger things have happened on social media. But honestly, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for reading. Um, and I would love it if all of my referral con- uh, content came from people actually doing organic referrals to friends and to uh, folks in the fly fishing community. So that's way better than anything that I can get on social media. Anyway, this week's recommendation is an artist. His Instagram handle is Stephen underscore draws. Stephen with a V underscore draws, D R A W S. His name is Stephen Weinberg. And he has an incredibly cool aesthetic. He paints, he paints a lot of stuff, but the main thing you'll see if you follow him on Instagram is he paints trout. And he does so in an incredibly minimalistic fashion. He, he has quite a few skills, but. I really dig his style and his aesthetic, and as I'm scrolling through his feed, I think I've probably liked every one of his images, Um, but very simple. Uh, When you look at it up close, even though it's minimalistic um, and you see the brush strokes, it's just as beautiful and just as kind of uh, eye-catching as the the whole piece. But when you look at the whole piece, um, it's really almost hard to see how minimalistic it is when you see the entire fish um, from from a further away view um, because it is just done so well the mixing of the colors it's the kind of thing that anybody could put in any space it is just as great for above the tying bench in the man cave um, as it would be for a living room um, I just really really dig it uh, and I think that it really captures the beauty of small fish um, there's something small about the proportions of the fish that he paints. And as someone who loves fishing for native trout uh, out here in the east and has done so in other places in the country, it really resonates with me. So definitely check out uh, Stephen's Instagram page. There, There's a link to where you can pick up his stuff. I have actually recommended his artwork before on Gift Guys because of its versatility and how I think that virtually anybody would appreciate it. But definitely check out his Instagram handle. Find the links to where you can get it. I will put a link to that on the show notes for this podcast page on castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe to your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. that has the stories to back it a life to be proud of it's a winchester life yeah baby six eight western oh, i'll be over there baby right there tune in every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern on waypoint tv